Hi, my name is Rick. My name is Tim. And this is Break It Down with Rick and Tim. Two cisgendered males talking about things during these challenging and unprecedented times. What is cisgendered? The way I can break it down is... See what I did? I saw what you did there. Are you happy with the sex and gender you were born with? Yeah. Same here. Therefore, cisgendered. Okay. Yeah. Did you learn something? I learned something. Yeah. I like how he just broke it down the first time. Right? Yeah. Way to break it down. <laughs> this podcast is already sucking ass. <gasps> the hell's going on? It's a good question. I'm glad I'm Italian. I'm not white. You kind of are. <sighs> Why does it have to be the big chicken? <laughs> Why does it have to be the big chicken? Why do you have to say it like that? <laughs> I was right, and yes. you were racist. It's Britney, bitch. <laughs> I still have a belief that Sasquatch is out there, but that doesn't make me crazy. And you give me that face, and this is my issue with you. Mm. You're a questionable person. This is a podcast where Rick, a Generation Xer, and Tim, a millennial, come together and try to find answers to our changing world. Break it down with Rick and Tim. All right. Mm. So for our first topic, we wanted to break things down with belief systems because growing up, we are programmed uh, subconsciously. We don't know this stuff that we're being taught by our social circles, church, school, family, friends, etc. We're like sponges and we absorb. So the three that we came down with were politics, religion, and in my case, Bigfoot. <laughs> So I think that you touched on the, the, the three main categories. So let's start. I think we should start with where it all kind of begins. And I, I think we should start with religion. What do you say? Sure. Well, let's break it down even more. And let's talk about some subcategories that you mentioned. You said who we surround ourselves with. So we've mm -hmm. got those three places. We've got our religion, our, our church, if we go to one. Uh, you've got our schools. We've got our home life. And what was the other one? Friends. Friends. Okay. So maybe... All these social circles. And let's see how those really shape our perspective of a belief system because that's where it all begins. So I like to start with religion because that's where, for me, it begins, right? At baptism. You're born and then you're drowned <laughs> immediately. What's your religion? Catholicism. So you're a Catholic. I am a Catholic. I guess you would not, not by choice i'm not necessarily catholic now i uh never officially left the church but i just kind of stopped going to church and from uh, the beginning of my life all the way until out of college it was a big part of my belief system because that's kind of like the framework that i grew up in i uh of course i don't remember my my baptism but i remember like my brother's baptisms i remember my parents had my brother baptized in our living room. Um, and I remember, you know, as a, as a young child seeing that, I, remember, I have images of that in my head still. So it's very much a big part of my life. Um, and I remember my first confession. That was the first thing that they, that they kind of take you through. How old were you? Ah, oh, God, I was first grade, I think I was. So seven, seven years old. What did you have to confess? Just things we learned about what sin was, right? They taught us, you know, you know, just being mean and that kind of thing. I mean, they just made you anything you felt guilty about. You go in there, you tell the, the priest, and then seven. it's all okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, my all gosh. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's when they begin, right? Programming from the very beginning. Mm hmm Instead of going out and playing and learning about life, about young independent social circles, you're thrown into an adult situation having to confess for something that you really don't know what you're confessing about at the age of seven. Right. I remember my mom giving me like a list of things to say, like, they, oh, you were mean to your brother and things of that nature. And I'm like, okay, whatever. I'll go in there and do that. And, and confession was never, I never really like felt a value in it. I just knew I had to do it. And then they would give you like a, a, a so many prayers to say and this one and this one and this one. You go through the whole process. And then you go out there afterwards and walk up and sit there and 
say what however many Hail Marys or Our Fathers they mm. tell you, and you're just like, this is ridiculous. But, you know, as a kid, you know, it's more, yeah, it's kind of a social thing. You kind of go out, and you're with your friends, and you go into the box, and you look at each other like, oh, my God, what did you tell them? And it's, it's kind of fun, but... You know, it, it, that's what Catholicism oh. was. It, you're right. It was an indoctrination of you need to feel guilty, and then here's how you unguilty yourself. You go in and you tell people what you did. Wow. Yeah, I'm Episcopalian, not by choice. I was baptized in that church, Holy Communion, the whole thing. My dad was first-generation Italian. Uh, my grandmother came from Italy, mm. and she left the Catholic Church because in the 1940s, you really couldn't divorce your husband and she was bound to divorce my grandfather because he was abusive verbally mm. horrible horrible drunk and so she says fine <laughs> so she joined uh, a pentecostal church and they embraced my grandmother with love and joy and she was a lucky christian woman very lucky to have found that Yes, especially because, you know, at that time, especially divorced. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And she was a trendsetter for the yeah. 1940s. Mm -hmm. You know, we, the war just ended, and my dad came back from the war, and my Nona, my grandmother, was now a divorced woman. I was like, wow, talk about, you know, taboo. And back then in downtown Los, An Los Angeles, there were blocks. You had the Italian block, the Hispanic block, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And just, I can't imagine what it must have been like for her. She must have been an apostate, a pariah. Your grandmother was born in the late 1800s, right? Correct. Yeah, because my dad uh, was uh, 92 when he passed away, and I was 47. So I'm 50 years old now. So, yeah, I was a surprise baby. But nonetheless, yeah, they came over on the boat, had my dad in the 1920s. He served in World War II, had me in 1972. Yeah. Okay. So your your dad was born in the 1920s. My parents were born in the 19 late 1940s, 1950s. Mm. And still, I mean, comparatively to to people my age, my parents are relatively old. Um, they had a lot of kids in their 30s. How many? 40s. Six. Six of us. There's six of you. Where do you fit in all that? Um, uh, the third. I'm in wow. the middle. Yeah. Did you have a positive upbringing with the faith? It, it's mixed because my parents are, are liberal for the most part, but honestly, the Catholic Church isn't really that liberal, or at least the people that are in it. So when we go back to who we surround ourselves with in the, the church aspect of it, you know, there was a lot of mixed messages kind of with the faith that we had. And and one of the things, too, is I remember as a kid uh, after 9-11 was uh, in Boston, the uh, Catholic Church. This is kind of where I kind of, I didn't break away from the church, but I started thinking, okay, maybe something's not right here, is when the Boston um, Archdiocese scandal came out. It was... Uh, uh, like five or something priests that had, that they just kept moving around from different school to school to school or place to place to place, and they were uh, molesting kids. So instead of fixing the problem, they made it worse. They made it worse. They made it worse. They just oh. they just were thought, well, maybe if we keep moving them around, the problem will just kind of go away on its own. But it never this really was in did. the news, the Boston Globe, I think. It was the Boston Globe. I, I believe they were the ones who broke it, and it was mm -hmm. it was a big deal because it was right after nine eleven. But they had the evidence, and it's like, well. You can't not run this story because, you know, kids' lives are at stake here. And I remember that filtering out and, you know, it, it came in contact with my family because a, a priest that was, you know, a family friend of ours was accused. And at that time, it was kind of around uh, a time when a lot of people were making accusations just to get money. So, oh. uh, you know, I mean, like when you look at the evidence... It was questionable. Dates and times didn't match up, but uh, what ended up happening was is the archdiocese just decided to settle the lawsuit, and they didn't do it with the permission of the priest. They just did it. Oh, wow. To save face. To save face. Mm -hmm. Wow. Kind of like Michael Jackson when he was accused, he just paid him off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Woo! This is where I kind of broke away. Uh, I was supposed to get confirmed, and I never did. And I had been going to Catholic schools all my life, so I just was done. 
so you had a lot of really conservative um, Catholics that I experienced. Uh, for example, and this kind of segues into politics a little bit, but the idea of a single issue voter, I experienced that in Catholicism for the first time. I remember a teacher at my Catholic school uh, was walking up back and forth, uh, pacing back and forth at the front of the, the class one day, and she goes, it's about time for us to vote. Some of you are going to be old enough to vote, and I'm going to tell you how I vote. I am a single issue voter. Any candidate that is pro-life will get my vote wow. and i will not vote for any candidate that is not pro-life and she was walking up and down as if she was telling us the truth this is how you do it and it was like right at the time where i was getting into politics for the first time because yeah i'm getting close to voting and i'm like well what about like the war in iraq what about like you know, all these terrible things that are happening right now. You don't care about anything else? No. I just care about the babies. The oh. unborn babies. Let me let me refer. I, yeah. I care about the unborn babies. And now we have the issue. But what about when the kids are alive and in school? You don't care about that? Well, no. Because yeah. they're born. And they exist. And everything they do from then on out is their choice. And if they choose to be born into poverty, well, then... So we're living in an interesting age right now where people of a certain IQ level are being literally brainwashed to multiple venues of media. MAGA! Uh, Do you think it's an IQ level thing? Oh, absolutely. Because the more educated you are, like in the big cities, people who are attorneys and for the most part, uh, people who are high level executives you know, they know money comes first. We're a capitalist society and don't vote against the money. And so states like red states like Georgia, companies are wanting to pull out now because their employees aren't happy. Then they're going to start, you know, hemorrhaging employees. For instance, California, Disneyland, before LGBTQIA was embraced and supported, a lot of Disney's uh, employees were leaving and joining DreamWorks in the animation department and in the creative fields because Disney was not uh, supporting of their partners, insurance, et cetera, of that, et cetera, et cetera. So Disney decided, okay, we're losing talent. Right. And now we've got right. Shrek happening, and that's not us. That's our talent making Shrek over there. So they're uh uh so Disney did an about face in regards to accepting LGBTQIA people as guests to their parks and to their employees and their families and oh did the churches have Baptist churches, the Fred Phelps Church from Westboro from Kansas you know they were picketing Disney and this is in of the, course nineteen nineties two thousands time frame. So, you know, we're now living that all over again because of women's issues. You're right. a father. Right. I'm you a father. You have two. I have two daughters, six and almost two. And I cannot imagine living in a, a state where all of a sudden I have to worry that if something happened to one of my daughters and she needed uh, medical care, an abortion, she wouldn't be able to get it. And I'm fortunate that, that I've got a car that could probably make it to state's lines, but then I also have to think there's a lot of people who don't have that. Right, and they're going to point at you, well, you have white privilege. I do have white privilege. I have an amazing amount of white privilege. I am not just white, but I am a man. But then at the same time, I like to think of us as a community where we live. And for instance, if one of our neighbors needed help in transportation, I think we would offer it. We would help. Right. Easily. But now they're making laws that say if you help, you can go to jail. Right. I, I believe that we are all here to give and receive love. And by helping others, you're giving love. Right. You know, and that seems to be missing today with today's politics. And you're absolutely systems. right. It, it, it drives me nuts. There's, there's no more empathy. It's Complete all lack. about and division and hate and... It's entirely Donald Trump's fault because he gave it a platform. You had some very bad people in that group. 
But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. So let's look at another thing that we surround ourselves with. The news, the media. So you're right. What is that platform? Where does where does all, where do people get their their news from? Their media sources, right? And social circles. The internet is a tremendous player in this game. If Jim Jones in the 1970s had the internet, or Waco, David Koresh, or Heaven's Gate, that cult in San Diego, that we didn't have the internet like we do now. Just yeah. imagine, imagine if Adolf Hitler enforcing his belief systems as a superior race had the internet. He had movie and he had radio and print. That's right. You know, but just imagine. Just imagine the reach. reach. Yeah. Yes. You know, so the internet has been a tremendous player in this. And I have a theory that, you know, I believe I can back this up. People of a certain IQ level, and I've said this before, they get their information their teachers are the internet, their friends, social circles. We, we're all like that. We all absor- learn from our friends. Right. But what they are seeing on television from a channel that perpetuates itself as a news channel, when in fact it's not, talking about Fox here, right? they're thinking, wow, this must be true. This must be real. And then you have a president saying the same stuff and regurgitating what those blonde bottle heads are saying on that channel right wow it just reinforces itself so let's throw a little statistics out here so that we can see how big that is fox news for example their viewership last time i checked um was 130 million viewers and the united states itself is about 330 340 million people so that's about a third of the entire United States. So if you think about the reach that he has, that's incredible. Yeah. Right? And during his presidency, Donald Trump's presidency, he would go on Fox News and just ramble. Mm-hmm. He would just ramble and people would listen to him and they would give him that airtime. So uh, how did Donald Trump take all those MAGA believers and make them, you know, political tools, tools. <laughs> by having these rallies, by selling merchandise, the hats, the t-shirts, the slogans, my God, you know? It's- so this is where I think there's a separation between people who can think critically and people who can't. And this is where I tell my students, cause I'm a teacher that you know you've won an argument or at least that you've gotten to a point where you can walk away feeling, you know, confident that you have actually won whatever or you've come out on top of whatever argument or dispute you have. And that's when the other person starts to attack your character. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. And they're not talking about the substance of the argument anymore. Right, it's a deflection tool. It's a deflection tool, but it's also something that feels really good because you're you know you're attacking someone's you know buttons and you're gonna try to get them to be hot. And Donald Trump loves to do that, and people love to see no question. And people love to see a fight. So they go to the rallies not because they want to hear him say something you know productive. They want to hear him say something mean and 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 controversial. They want that 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 fight. It's who can make the other person feel bad right? to the point where they don't want to play anymore. And the people going to the rallies weren't necessarily going for information. They were going to... For entertainment. They're going to be entertained. To own the libs. Right. Because it's entertainment. It's fun. It's like going to WWE Mm -hmm. or going to NASCAR. You know, you go to WWE to see somebody's face get bashed in. You go to NASCAR to see a crash. It's the same crowd. You go to hockey to see a fight. Yeah. Right? It's, it's, you go for the chaos. Yeah. Fox knowingly peddled election lies for ratings. There's a, a text in particular from Tucker Carlson, and he is suggesting here that a Fox News White House correspondent should be fired for 
fact-checking a Trump claim about the election. He says, please get her fired. I'm actually shocked. It needs to be stopped immediately, like tonight. It's measurably hurting the company. The stock price is down, not a joke. Donald Trump and his sycophants have tapped into our darker nature. Right. You know. Right. And some of these people, they don't know when to pull back. They go too far. Hence. Well, they go all the way to the Capitol. <laughs> they go right to the top. And now, because they're unhappy way things are progressing, which is not a bad thing, they're all saying, oh, civil war, civil war. How? What? With what money? How are you going to provide a war with no financial income to back it? Wars are all based on money. You're right. Well, and it's all about money in this case. And if you look at the way they're going, I don't think the money's following them. No. And if they were to suddenly get millions of dollars given to them by, let's say, a foreign country, they'll just pocket it and buy new pickup trucks. They've never had that kind of money before. So it'll be just look what Steve Bannon did with the money for Bill the Wall. They're just going to pocket it. Right. Well, look at what Mississippi did with the welfare money. Oh, my gosh. That Brett Favre guy. Yeah. For speeches he never gave. Right. Well, they just paid him. And I think he just was like, I'm not going to ask where the money comes from. And as long as you don't tell me, it's all okay. You know, this is a segue into people, good people, hardworking people who are susceptible to this being manipulated for people like the haves and the have nots. They're being manipulated by the haves. So if the haves can have even more money. Right. Right. These people know how to push buttons. For example, I remember when Roe versus Wade was overturned, the Democrats were now sending out emails and making YouTube advertisements saying, donate now. We of have course. to fight. And I'm like, this decision by the Supreme Court is still warm. It hasn't had a chance to, you know, be absorbed by all of us for us to think about what just happened to us. And now they're asking for money? Of course. It's all a game. Politics is a game. And I argue even religion is a game. Look at all those uh, uh, people like Jim and Tammy Faye Baker that were on the 700 Club, uh, Jerry Falwell, uh, Pat Robertson. Those MFers are responsible for what's happened now with Roe versus Wade being overturned. Right. The, the Christian coalition. Well, let's break that down real quick. When did... Um, politics and religion come together. 1980s. 1980s. Yes. Okay. Do you remember exactly Jerry Falwell? What? Jerry Falwell. And what? Tell me about Jerry Falwell. He was all about uh, the abortion issue. Right. So and that, he was a charmer, and he knew how to speak, just like Bill Clinton, like Barack Obama, and he knew how to push people's buttons. Right. And so he created this coalition, which and then did what? Well, it became the single voter issue with people. Churches, for example, all denominations were kind of going in line with this. The there Christian coalition. That's what it is. It's that single issue voter, right? Mm -hmm. Here is the most important thing that we need to address and needs to be addressed now. Other issues be damned. Other issues right. be swept under the bus. Unfortunately, we have people, well, fortunately, actually, because it's a double-edged sword, uh, Clarence Thomas has made it clear that marriage equality is next to be struck down. He didn't keep that card hidden. And no. so now we have a tremendous movement in protecting marriage equality because of his little blunder. If he had kept his mouth shut... Yeah, people would still be assuming that they're probably going to target other marginalized people. But it would not have had the force of impact like the House voting to, you know, codify marriage. and Right. So we're seeing, going back to statistics, if we break the voters down into three groups, you've got the MAGAs, right? Uh, the people who vote, well, the people who have voted for Donald Trump. And you have the people who voted for whoever else that is not Donald Trump. And then you have the other group that didn't vote at all and just kind of stood by and watched it happen, right? Now we're seeing, I think, is that third group of the people who didn't do anything, they're starting to go, okay, well, I need to do something because things aren't going very well. All of a sudden, a lot of people lost their rights, a lot of people being women right. in certain states. 
and other things are happening that 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 aren't going so well for them you know they're not getting a return on their investment when they put money into the stop the steal rally or something like that and i'm going back into this first group here but i think we're starting to pull people who maybe push their influence enough in the last election Mm -hmm. and they're realizing the the power of their own vote and we're starting to see that in some of these smaller elections i mean look at sarah palin she just lost in alaska yeah that was great that was great yeah Wake look, up call. Look at the, the the abortion law that was struck down in, what was it, Kansas? Yeah, of right? all red states. Of all red states, an abortion law. The place where, like, you know. The women, yeah. I think it's amazing. with Roe versus Wade being overturned, the Christian coalition made the biggest mistake because it was always a fantastic platform for them to trigger people, manipulate people, get money, and use it as a talking point on Fox News and at their churches and their little social circles. I don't think, I think the, the educated higher-ups in the Republican Party never wanted or intended it to happen. And when it happened, they're like, oh. Because now they When realize, it happened, they were like, oh, what? They were like, oh, what? Oh, shit. This is what I do to my students. <laughs> they hate it, but they love it. They love it, though. They what? They, oh, gaga. Oh, that's not any better. <laughs> Jesus Christ. They were Christ. like, okay, how about this? They were like, no, what the hell? No, because then all their political careers are in jeopardy now because of that. They were enjoying the red wave. And when that red wave came crashing down and turned into a tsunami with angry villagers coming back to the coastline, they're in trouble. And we just saw it with Sarah right. Palin. We saw it with Kansas right. voting for women. This extreme that we that they've been using as this talking point, as this this point of, you know, grabbing votes, all of a sudden not only is is it putting them in jeopardy, but they don't have it anymore. Right. It's gone. So people aren't going to be voting on these single issues anymore because they, they know that it's a it's not it, it's not that it's not an issue anymore. It's just it's a very muddy issue. I, I disagree. Okay. Because of what the Supreme Court did, it's now become a single issue. Women's rights, period. And so I think that's going to drive people to the voting booths and mail in blah, blah, blah. I think that's going to be even Joe Biden said it. The issue that the Republicans have had for so long, this abortion rights has now flipped on them. Yes. Because they have passed these laws that now make it an issue for the Democrats to get out and stop because all of these issues, all of these uh, abortion rights, all these women's rights, these basic human rights are now gone. And now they're in jeopardy or they're, they're, they have a rallying cry. So they've given the Democrats essentially a gift. Right. And a lot of people are going to go out and vote based on that one single issue. You're right. It is a single issue vote. And the majority of voters tend to be women, statistically. Right. Statistically. Statistically. Yeah, I sound like you now. Statistically. 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 So we talked about my upbringing in Christianity as a belief system and, and how I just kind of fell out of it. Thunk. Thunk. And I guess the problem also with that is, you know, then I have to navigate a world without uh, Catholicism, which means I have a lot more time on Sundays. Speaking of worlds that we live in and how they affect us, you were also in a belief system. Right. I mentioned Episcopalian earlier, Mm -hmm. but it really did not have an impact or influence on my life. Right. Because the way I was raised, and my mother, if you knew my mother, she was like the dowager from Downton Abbey. You know, it's like, oh, that looks good on you. Yeah. (laughs) So she used the church, her Church of England, the Episcopalian Church, for more of an appearance, pomp Mm -hmm. and circumstance, you know, so... You know, as long as you had the beliefs put in you that, you know, your conscience tells you what's good and what's bad, you know, that's, you know, that's God talking to you. I remember that from my mother and I appreciated that. And I like that very limited and small religious influence that my parents gave me. Uh, There was no baptisms in the house, nothing like that. So I kind of grew up not as an atheist, but... Just knowing that there is good and bad, and your soul tells you, your conscience tells you what's right and wrong. And in my case, I can only speak for me, because it's my life, 
it worked, you know? And so I learned to do the best I can. Did I fail? Yes, of course. Did I make mistakes? Was I a bully at certain points in my life? Of course. It's how we learn. You know, we, why am I kicking the dog? Not literally, but why am I, you know, picking on someone's because no dogs were harmed in the making of this video. <laughs> right. Nonetheless, uh, I fell into a cult. And, and tell me about this cult, Victor. Earlier in the podcast, I mentioned Bigfoot. Now, it's not like the Waco, Texas Heaven's Gate that we got to castrate ourselves and then be teleported up to the UFO that's behind the comet. Bigfoot is a belief system. People that think a hairy monster running through the woods, leaving footprints, uh, it's a belief system because there's no body. There's no evidence, real evidence. You can say these foot casts are evidence. In fact, they're not. Nonetheless, uh, it's a self-perpetrating uh, confirmation biased group of people that just because you see something quick move in the woods, it's a Bigfoot. Because you're schizophrenic and you're hearing things in your head, it's Bigfoot. They call it mind speak. Uh, Everything's a Bigfoot. Oh, look at these twigs that are in front of me. Bigfoot gave me that. Therefore, I must give Bigfoot something back on the gifting stump. I'm not making this up. It just continues and just... It sounds like a religion. It's a belief system. Yeah. And you get caught up in it. And I've always been critical, a critical thinker. And so I would mock me being a bully. Some of these people on my YouTube show called Off the Richter. Now, I was on a Bigfoot reality show called The $10 Million Bigfoot Bounty. It was on Spike TV. Now, sometimes it seemed like you guys were more interested in, in mixing it up with each other than in finding Sasquatch. Here's a little taste of that. I think the weakest link would have to be the two Jumbotrons. There's just one team with the bald Fonzie and the little short midget that he hangs out with. The Bigfoot 101 that Richter normally refers to is bullshit because they haven't found any Bigfoot. I'm here to play a game just like everybody. We're not in a game. This you is our lifestyle, and we've been I doing this for years. Me too. I've been hunting no. for years. And it's like the Amazing Race and Big Brother combined. If you find Bigfoot, you win $10 million. And the money was real. Well, good for the producers because Bigfoot's not real. Oh, no. Spoiler alert. It's not. I've been in the Bigfoot world for 10 years. This is my truth, my journey, and this is what I have found. It's all just a big sham, just like religion, just like politics. You have these higher ups in this particular niche group of our society calling the shots. Uh, buy my book, pay me, and I will take you out looking for Bigfoot. So let's break that down. Because I think that I've experienced a little bit of that, too, in Catholicism. And I think there's a lot of parallels here. Because something that you just said right there, buy my book. Um, and then you mentioned an altar, right? A so, gifting stump. A gifting stump. A gifting so stump. I'm going to tell do you mind if I tell you a brief story? Yeah. Um, long story short, um, we had some guest speakers at my Catholic high school that brought a statue of the Mother Mary that bled from her eyes. For real? Yeah. Real tears of blood. Wow. Uh, so they say. So they say. So they say. We had a mass. They gave a speech kind of sermon thing, the people who brought the thing, and we got to go up for con communion and then walk by it and have a moment in front of the statue and then move along and go back to our seats. Um, and I remember at the end of it, they wanted us to buy their book. There we go. See, you go to a Bigfoot conference, it's the same thing. Right. You know, and because of me being who I am and the Bigfoot world being so small, it is small. It's not as big as the UFO world or the ghost hunting world. Or the Catholic world. Right. But nonetheless, it still has its believers and those that tell you what to believe. Because of who I am as an openly gay man making content on YouTube and then being on a Bigfoot reality show, because I'm a gay man, that, I mean, the producer wanted all walks of life on his show and to have a sassy, you know, smart ass gay man, it was. I you were typecast. 
Right. And I took it. Sure. I, I'm all about using what you have, what sure. God gave you. And so, sure, I'll Got to flaunt it. I paid the price for it. Now we're going back to politics. Because the majority of the Bigfoot world are the uneducated MAGA type of people who don't understand empathy and giving and receiving love. All they know how, what to do is to put other people down. Might I use the term gay bash? Sure. I was verbally gay bashed on podcasts, on blog talk radio. Wow. What in the world? I mean, just really, what in the world made you, I mean, what did Richter have that made him even interested? Because I have yet to find anything interesting about him other than that exactly. he's just a flaming homo. <laughs> and he's he can't. <laughs> he's an asshole. He Someone wanted to throw a copperhead snake into my tent. And so I asked my friends, what's that? And they're like, it's a deadly snake. I'm like, great. What did I do? On the show, I put food coloring in my plaster cast. So if I found a Bigfoot footprint, my plaster casts were pink. Oh. It just stood out from everybody else's plaster cast. Sure. And it became a topic on the show. Of course. I was verbally harassed about it with these Bigfoot people on their podcasts. Was it got to be pink? I'm like, well, first of all, it white washes out. Pink might bring out some certain details that the white won't show. That was my explanation for it. And but because, because pink is fabulous. They call me the F-A-G word, which I don't feel comfortable saying. Fair. Yeah, they, they just were just brutal. And what did I do? I was just living my authentic life. This was before Donald Trump. The show came out in 2014. Fast forward now, I now see things a lot clearer. I was drinking the Kool-Aid, and I thought these people were my friends. They weren't. And now that I left the church as an apostate, a pariah, no one talks to me. I've lost all my friends. You've met a couple of them. One of them. He doesn't come around anymore. I'm bad for business. Sure. You know, so, and this is the truth. And so just because you're telling the truth doesn't mean you're going to go unpunished. So you say this is all about bad for business. Do you think that the people who are the most influential in the Bigfoot world, do you think they believe that Bigfoot is real? Or do you think that they believe they are creating uh, essentially a theme park ride for people to come in and enjoy while he profits from their enjoyment. Everyone that is in front of the camera on a Bigfoot television show or speaking at a Bigfoot conference knows exactly what they're doing because this is their income or side hustle, giving the people what they want. And here's the big shocker. It's the boys club. It's all about getting laid you don't say i know this for a fact bigfoot is code for sex let's say you're a, a male cisgendered proud redneck male and you want to go out looking mm. for bigfoot does your wife really want to go with you no no so the boys get together they start drinking and there's those couple girls that might come along that are not normally up to normal attractiveness and standards, but are you nonetheless, calling them heifers? Uh, some of these females are road hard and put up wet, but oh, nonetheless, gross. but nonetheless, they're giving away the kitty for free. And you got these guys that are all drunk and giving each other a high five, scoring with these chicks while they're out big footing. They all do it. I have been in Bigfoot for 10 years. I have yet to get laid. You're in the wrong place. Granted, I should have been on RuPaul's Drag Race. I get it as a gay man. Nonetheless, I have had some of these Bigfooters who are married hit on me. Even at my swingers. worst. Right. It's the swingers club. Mm. I, from what I understand, this happens in politics. Oh, sure. Church? Well, look Humans at, bring the drama. I get it. Of course. It's, it's every human nature. I get it. But when you're in a field of 
Deceivery. Ooh, I like that. The field of deceivery. Mm. Bigfoot. What are you going to get? People that like to deceive others. And I was surrounded by it. I had my fill of it. I was over it. That's the truth when it comes to Bigfoot. You have these haves who are creating the monster, turning the Native American myth into something that it's not, a being with superpowers that can teleport from another planet called Janu, and his name is Zorth, and he will turn into a tree. And what are you talking about, Scientology now? No, but it's a very simple belief system. So it's not just Bigfoot, Richter. It's 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 religion in in like the the priests and the power they hold over you know the the, the people. The televangelist, the like Jim Baker. Like Jim Baker. It's it's about the cult leaders. It's it's it even it even comes into into Hollywood. Uh, two examples I can think of. Uh, a simple one: Jake Gyllenhaal and Taylor Swift. You got this young girl coming in, and he's like, "Oh, I'll introduce you to Hollywood. I'm just going to grab you right up." Right, this older man, young girl, and then Harvey Weinstein. Look at that. He had so much power and he abused it. You want this role? Right? On a bigger level. Um, you want this role? I'll I'll uh you can come over here and do some 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 sexual for me. <laughs> wow. So, yes. And 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 you got it, right? So as you may see, we are not in the kitchen anymore. We are in our studio, which you will see as we transition further down the road in a few episodes. But for now, we're going to just shoot this little tidbit that we forgot right here in the studio because we don't want to go back to the kitchen and try to fake it. We're authentic. <laughs> Since Tim is a teacher yeah, and he's used to quizzing students, I thought I would... Shake things up with him since my name is Richter and create a segment called Let's Quiz Tim. Every episode, I quiz Tim on things regarding the subject that we're talking about. And since for episode one, the topic was belief systems, I think it's time to let's quiz Tim. Okay. Let's go. Which came first, Hinduism, Buddhism, or Judaism? Ooh, that one's tough. Buddhism? Is that your final answer? I'm going to say yes, which I'm probably wrong. Hinduism. I was going to say Hinduism first. One of the two. Yeah. I'm not sure. Which came first? Christianity, Islam, or MAGA? <laughs> that one's easy. Well, wait, now wait a second. Okay, so I want to say Islam came first because uh, Jesus was like 2,000 years ago, and Islam has been around longer than that, I want to say. First century was Christianity. Really? And the seventh century, Islam. Oh, really? Yeah. So I don't know anything is what it comes down to. I didn't pay attention much. I was a C student. If you remember in the book of Eli at the end, spoiler alert, the Bible that the main character was in charge of protecting, spoiler alert, as a blind man, which is pretty awesome, mm -hmm. is placed between the Jewish um, book and Islam. It was right in the middle. Ah. Which came first? Expensive. Betty. Sorry, go ahead. Which came first? Betty and Barney Hill UFO abduction story or the Travis Walton abduction story? I have absolutely no clue, so I'm going to flip a coin and I'm going to go with B. Travis Walton. Yeah. <clears throat> See, I'm just... Betty and Barney Hill. Getting them all wrong. Was it 1961? You know what's crazy? I haven't gone with my gut on any of these, and my gut told me every right answer. And nobody's going to believe me. And Travis Walton, which and the movie, shouldn't. The Fire in the Sky, was based on 1975. Mm. No, this is the last and final question for Let's Quiz Tim okay. for our first so episode. I'm going to go with my gut on this one immediately. Where? It's going to be wrong. Was the Catholic Church founded? Where? Rome. No. <laughs> Jerusalem. <laughs> of course it was. 
<laughs> That'd be like you quizzing me about like all of gay history and not knowing who like Judy Garland was sure. or Barbra Streisand. Exactly. And well, I mean, the how Catholic... many number one songs Madonna's had? You gotta understand, like Mike's, but like, who pays attention to the history of the Catholic Church? <laughs> <laughs> Millions of people. I know they do. <laughs> this is probably the funniest. Let's quiz Tim. It's probably the the most unsuccessful <laughs> one ever. Okay, just got them all wrong. Let's do the whole thing over. I'll just get them all right, and nobody will know the difference. <laughs> so for this segment, we are going to call this "Let's Trigger Richter," and it's really aimed at getting Rick's blood a boiling. Mm. Right. It's so. Easy to do. <laughs> Prince Harry, is he throwing his family under the bus for money? And does he have a right to do it if he is? Prince Harry, is he throwing his family under the bus? Is he pulling back the veil, the curtain? Is he just sick and tired of the bullshit? And seeing its effect on his wife and his family, I think he's doing the right thing. However, I don't know why he needs to be talking about his frostbitten penis in his book. I think that's kind of is stupid. That what, is that what he talked about? Yeah, when he went up to the North Pole. Can you imagine he, thawing that shit out? Oh. Well, he uh, wasn't wearing the right pants. And so he didn't realize it was frostbitten until like a couple weeks later. Oh. Good thing so. it didn't like... But yeah, that, that's stu- it's stupid. And Or did it? A lot of these... And he is a celebrity. A mm-hmm. lot of celebrities... Don't have people around them. It's like, you know what? That's not a good idea. Bring it back. No, they're all surrounded by yes men. George Lucas, I'm going to create Jar Jar Binks. Lisa back. Oh, you know, so no one said no to him. Sure. You know, Madonna, look what she's doing to her face. Look no at what happened no to, to our country with Donald J. Trump. Michael Jackson. Right, just that, all these people around him that, that aren't going to tell him no. with yes people, sure. and it's it does him no good. You got to sure. have some people around you that's like that knows you, that knows what you're about, because it's easy to get distracted and it's easy to lose sight of yourself. Sure. When I was doing my off the Richter video shows about making fun of Bigfooters, I kind of got a little carried away, and I had some friends towards the final season kind of pull me back, get me realigned with my original concept. And it's good to have that. Right. You're like that with me in my life. You sure. bring me down, especially right. when I want to go beat up homeless people. That is true. That is an insane <laughs> example. But yes. I'm not violent. Yet. Verbally, I'm violent, but not physically. <laughs> He's just verbally abusive. He's not physically abusive. This yeah. is, what's the difference between the two? All right. Still, um, they both create trauma. <laughs> right. My wife got the book. My oh. wife got Prince Harry's book. And... Uh, my two-year-old just stares at the cover. Oh. She just loves, because it's a fellow redhead. Like, based on, I haven't read the book, and based on the limited, very limited knowledge I have of it, it sounds like, uh, I mean, this poor kid, let's be real, he's still very much young. I mean, how old is he? Uh, he's around your age. Yeah. He might be, might be just a little bit older than you. Okay. So he's in his 30s. He grew up in this celebrity life, uh, but it wasn't a glamorous one in the least bit because he was the product of uh, a a broken marriage Mm -hmm. that was very much publicized. And uh, I remember hearing about his, like, response and reaction to looking at the pictures and such of his mother's death. And I remember, like... And he had people that said, no, don't see all of them. Right. And he had someone that like, you don't see, the, you right. know. But and I empathize with him a little bit here because I remember, I remember that when that happened. Like, when, do you remember, what, 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 what was, was that? July, summer of 1997. 1997. And I remember seeing on TV, I remember watching, and she, you could see her moving, like, a little bit. And you, it was just flashes all over the place. And in the book, uh, in the pictures, he describes the orbs and... Like I was like, oh, God, I remember looking at that when I when it happened when I was like in the moment, and so like I'm like, yeah, dude, I get it. the The paparazzi is crazy. The family is nuts yes. because everybody's throwing each other under the bus for publicity. And if I were him, 
Hell yeah. I'd be like, you know what? I'm just going to lay it all out. And then if you, if, you, if he's any, he, if he's like me, yeah, I wouldn't care if people knew that I got a frostbitten penis. I'd put it in the book. Why not? <laughs> I think it just takes away from it. That's sure. It's, but it's at the same time, it, but at the same time, Rick, it's a personal thing and it's, it's his decision and it might take away from the story, but it gives us a little bit more insight as to what kind of shit he goes through. Well, since so. I mentioned earlier, people don't surround themselves with the right anchoring down to earth people mm-hmm. in the Netflix documentary series of Megan and Harry, Megan, uh, does the curtsy that she duplicates the curtsy she gave the queen the first time she met her. And it was, I thought to be very offensive. Mm. And he just kind of sat there and he's just kind of looking at her and she does this over the top bow and with her arms reached out and it's gross. That should not have been in the documentary because people are going to use that against them. And they have. Good morning. Good morning, Roya. One of the segments that seemed to jump out at a lot of people was when uh, Megan was demonstrating what it was like to bow before the queen. And that's getting a lot of attention. Will you kind of break that scene down for us? Sure. Across the world. I'm sure they have. I'm sure they have. And they're going to use anything they can because at the end of the day, it's back to one. Of, it's a tabloid thing. It's a it's a everybody wants drama and really the royal family is all yeah. about the drama so they're gonna latch on to whatever they can you know squeeze this is what triggers me what triggers you rick the head of the anglican church the representation of the church of england uh-huh. is a philanderer who married his mistress okay that sets me off yet because uh princess margaret couldn't marry the man she wanted because he was a divorcee yes the Queen's sister was not allowed to marry Peter Townsend, who Be- was yeah. And then the, here we have Prince Charles. Oh, you can say all oh, the times have changed, et cetera, et cetera. Sure, sure. And then Harry and William asked and told their father, "Please don't marry this woman," and he still did. The other woman won. I don't have a trigger necessarily with Harry and William and all that. My issues with Camilla. Sure. And I think she's a vile, nasty woman. And I tried to change. I opened Hamlet. Hmm. Lonely prince, obsessed with dead parent, watch his remaining parent fall in love with dead parents' usurper. I slammed it shut. No, thank you. Yeah. We found the trigger. And she came out on top. She did. Now, do you think she is going to come out on top fully in the end here? Or do you think that karma is going to... I don't know. Maybe if somebody dumps it. and pot of Diana's blood all over her. Oh, wow. (laughs) (laughs) I think Camilla is very miserable and she's stuck because if she didn't have the royal family finances to help her, what would she have? Right. Right. It's kind of her... And the way she touches children, like that little black child when she was touching that child. You saw that video where she's you saw that, right? When she's like lifting that kid's arm up. I'm sure you're going to show it right now. You haven't seen it? I've seen it, Rick. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm just saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, that, that bothered me. Yeah, no. Yeah. I, I, can, I can see how she bothers you. Do you think that Prince Harry has the right to reveal her? Absolutely. There you go. Yeah. All right. Because she had a hand in Princess Diana's death. Yeah. And so did Charles. Their hands are not clean. I'm not saying they had it happen, no. But if they were not the vile, bad people that they were, Diana would still be here. Do you think that this, with the the interview, the book, the documentary, do you think Harry feels some vindication from the royal family? Possibly. At least the truth is out there as he sees it. And television shows and documentaries like The Crown will now have some material to go with where it's not going to be all fabrication. There you go. So, yeah, you got to trigger out of me on that one. All right. Well, that wraps up this episode. Yeah. Belief systems. Yeah. Part one. Part one. We broke it down into two parts. Yes, we did. We had a lot to talk about. Yeah, we did. You jumped right in. Yeah. It was pretty heavy stuff. In the next episode... uh, 
Tim, that is you. That's me. Talks about uh, some religious programming he mm-hmm. saw in our local park. Oh, yeah. It was... The was, devil tried to... The enemy... What was it? The enemy thought he had me. But then Jesus came and saved me. So it's all okay. He's a busy fellow. Right? <laughs> all over the place, saving people from the enemy. And I talk about what programming I had to personally overcome. That's my confession. Tune in next week. <laughs> Here's my Twitter handle, uh, Richter underscore Riolo. Boom. And here's mine, at Tim Breaks It Down. Yeah, so be sure to subscribe, give us a thumbs up, comment down below, and tell us about your belief systems. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are belief systems necessary? Uh, I don't know. It's a good question. We'll break that down. Bigfoot's not real. Spoiler alert.